All right, awesome guys. Okay, so this is great. I'm so glad that everybody came out here. We had people coming all the way from Jacksonville. David came from Illinois. E.T. came from Texas. I mean, anybody who came, uh, Jeff, where'd you come from? It wasn't too far, right? Oh, you live right here, okay. Grant, 20 minutes, Henry, Ryan, you guys are in this area. I'm glad to have all you guys here. Thank you so much for coming. Now, usually when I do seminars, I'm talking to old people, so I'm gonna be honest, this is good. Henry knows, he's a financial advisor like me. But this is gonna be great. Um, the main purpose of this event today is hopefully by the time that we're done with this, you guys are inspired, okay? So we have notebooks, we have the itinerary. I'll be honest with you guys, my life has changed within the last two to three years simply because I've been doing more, okay? So that's the title of this event today. And I also have a book that um, just came out. It's called The Power of Doing More. You guys have a QR code that you can scan and purchase that and that'll definitely help me out, get the reviews up. Um, we're gonna discuss a lot of gems on how you guys can achieve exactly what you want in life. Like I said, in these last two to three years, my life has changed, all right? So I started off after college, I played basketball in Europe, and to be honest, it was just fun. Jeff knows when you, <laughs> anything over there, you're, you're, you'll be lucky if you can make 500 to $1,000 a month, okay? So it's nothing, I met ET out there, it's, it's really nothing that's gonna get you to where you wanna get, all right? You have to have the proper financial vehicle to get you where you wanna get. A lot of us have passions and stuff, but that may not be the vehicle that's gonna get you to your destination. So when I came back, I realized, okay, I gotta buckle down. You know, I, I was doing Airbnb, ended up becoming a financial advisor. Then I started um, helping people after foreclosures. I have a foreclosure business, starting getting properties with Airbnb, doing things like that, Toro, just literally doing the most that I could possibly do. And people always ask me, how do you do this? How in the world do you have, I honestly have 15 streams of income, all right? So we're gonna get into that. We're gonna discuss how you guys can manage your life and get the most out of what you want in life, all right? So how to get more out of life, all right? So we, we always hear you are what you think, okay? We always hear, you know, you should have positive thoughts, things like that. But I'm gonna be honest with you guys, all right? These positive thoughts, they may not last forever, okay? So you have to become it before you become it. So whatever it is that you want in life, you have to actually mentally take yourself to that spot. All right, we have a lot of athletes in, this, um, in the building right now. You guys know, the coaches were always saying like, imagine yourself hitting that shot before you actually hit the shot. The same thing applies to business. Imagine yourself closing those deals, what, getting that property, okay? Doing the renovations, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you have to envision yourself doing it, all right? We always hear, what is your why? But we have to envision ourselves, all right? But to be honest, you have to truly believe it's meant for you, okay? You cannot be fake when it comes to life at all. You cannot outperform your own self-belief, okay? So if you're somebody and you're like, you know what, I, I really wanna be successful, okay? I, I want to do this, I want to do that, but you're not confident in yourself and you don't truly believe that it's meant for you, it's not gonna happen. So I'm here to let you guys know I believe in all you guys, you can do it. If I can do it, you guys can definitely do it, all right? So we have motivation and discipline, all right? We always hear about motivation, but to be honest, discipline is what's gonna push you through because what's gonna happen on those days where you're not motivated, all right? So the first thing we have to do is protect your vision, okay? So you guys, I'm pretty sure, have all gotten many visions, business ideas, things like that. You have to protect it, all right? We get these thoughts, we get these, um, these gifts from God, and it's for a reason, okay? If you ever shared an idea and somebody tried to like downplay it or you know said that you know that's probably not gonna work out screw them all right you have to protect your vision all right it's your vision for a reason okay we also have to understand that now is the time to take action to achieve success all right I'm gonna break this down this might open your eyes hopefully it does all right we spend one-third of our lives asleep all right there's 24 hours in a day and we spend one third of our lives sleeping, okay? This is something that I've been discussing with a lot of my friends and it's what I honestly feel. You're not really living life until after 21, okay? When you're growing up, your parents are kind of guiding you, telling you what you need to do, things like that. Once you're 21, you're, you're on your own, all right? So you have from your 20s to your 50s to build the life that you want to live. And if you're sleeping for one-thirds of your life, and that's 30 years, you now have 20 years to work with, 
okay? So if you guys are young, now is the best time, okay? The best time to take action and achieve everything we want because honestly, we're in our prime to earn and make money, okay? Maybe you guys might have some kids right now, but if you don't have kids, that's even better. Nothing against people with kids, but you have a lot of time and ability to, to work hard. And if you do have a kid, that's another driving factor to make you great. But from 20s to 50s, that's 30 years, we're sleeping, now we're left with 20. You have to start now, okay? So we have the new year coming up. We should not be thinking that, oh, in 2023, all of a sudden the flip, this, the switch is gonna flip. It's not gonna happen. We need to go into the new year with momentum and we understand that now is the time, all right? Because no one's coming to save you, all right? Once I realized that, I realized that my parents weren't coming to save me, no boss is coming to save me, nobody online is coming to save me. You have to do it for yourself, all right? So we have to understand what is wealth to you, okay? Once you guys identify what wealth is to you, then you can actually achieve it, all right? So when do you actually have fun? I have a lot of my friends here that are gonna speak in a little bit. We've been having some success and I'm pretty sure that they can agree to this. You start having fun when your expenses are paid, when you're not living paycheck to paycheck, all right? And the way that you don't live paycheck to paycheck is by doing more. We cannot rely on one stream of income. We have to have multiple streams of income. This will help us attain wealth a lot easier, okay? So you have to create a plan, okay? So when I wanted to do all these 15 streams of income, people were calling me crazy. They're saying, oh, don't, you should just focus on one thing, get really good at it. I was like, you, you don't even know who I am, what I can do, all right? I'm gonna create this plan, all right? Because you cannot freestyle life. You can't just say, oh, I wanna achieve this and then you know, give it a shot. It's not gonna work that way, all right? You have to have a plan. You have to have a blueprint, okay? And when you have a plan, it's not just a goal. You shouldn't be a, a vague goal like, okay, I want to be a millionaire or I want to um, become a real estate agent or I want to do this, I want to do that. You have to have a detailed step-by-step -step process to make sure that your goals get achieved, all right? So if you do want to become a millionaire, what exactly are you doing to achieve that? If you want to be the best real estate agent you can be, identify what niche you wanna get into and then the steps that you're gonna to do to get it. Outline everything, create that blueprint. This is going to be a visual reminder and something that you can outline and actually achieve, all right? Because when we have something that we can follow, this can help us with our discipline because now we know that, all right, I just need to do this in order to achieve this, all right? And also set visual reminders around the house. Right when I walk into my house, I have a big poster. It says, the time is now. All right, because there's no other time. The time is now, literally right now is the best time so that we can achieve greatness, all right? So now, uh, hopefully this motivation can get you guys some type of burning desire to want to achieve. Now we're gonna go over some strategies, all right? I'm not sure if you guys have been to um, any type of seminars or events, but usually they get a lot of people in and then they're gonna sell a product or anything like that. We're not here to do that. Today, we're here to give motivation and then information that you can apply so that you can go ahead and move forward, all right? So you guys know I'm into real estate, all right? We're gonna break down a few real estate strategies, all right? The first one is Airbnb, okay? This is my favorite stream of income because if you get started in Airbnb and you do it the correct way, you're, you're gonna be making profit, all right? There's, there's no reason why you shouldn't be making profit if you do it the correct way, all right? So with Airbnb, you can do this in many ways, all right? You can do rental arbitrage. That's when you reach out to property owners, you get the property, and then you list it on Airbnb. Now, of course, there is going to be some work that needs to be put in, all right? How can we find the properties and the landowners that are gonna allow us to list their property on Airbnb, all right? So to do this, you can search on Zillow, you can reach out to property owners, but honestly, the best way to achieve a property and get it listed on Airbnb is to just drive around, all right? You drive around, you see four rent signs, all right? This is gonna be a homeowner who is listing their property for rent. You reach out to them. You come in a professional way, all right? Everybody who's here today, if you guys reach out to me after this and you're interested in Airbnb, I have a exact script that you guys can present to that homeowner explaining like, look, this property is gonna be insured, we're gonna have professional cleaners. You actually have a legitimate business that you're looking to do luxury rentals. You're not just doing Airbnb and you know, you're, you're just having regular 
um, bedding and things like that. You want to have it proper. That's why I said Airbnb is always going to work if you guys do it the correct way. All right, the next way is going to be actually owning the home. All right, just like this, this home right here. All right, this home is about two million, and the mortgage on this is fifteen to seventeen thousand. All right, they make that in a weekend. Okay, so if you own a property and you see what your mortgage is, that's what I do. I own all of my properties now on Airbnb. I started with rental arbitrage. But when you own it, you just take your mortgage and then you want to see, all right, what's that daily rate? All right, if my mortgage is 1,200, all right, I'm gonna divide that by 30, okay, 40. All right, well, let's 3X this. Let's list it on Airbnb for 120. I'm gonna make my profit, okay? So that's the next way. The third way for Airbnb is also something that you guys can get started in. And this is going to just be helping homeowners listed on Airbnb. Also, there's a company um, Vacasa, Emmanuel's actually in that. You guys can talk to him about that. But this is where you're pretty much a property manager for Airbnb. And Airbnb is not like a standard rental. It, it's not hard to manage at all. Literally, you guys have the cleaner. You're going to reach out to them. But Airbnb is a great form of um, income in real estate. All right. Then the next one, we have fix and flip. All right. So a lot of you guys have probably seen the shows on HGTV. Um, I have my contractor, my man Rusty here, he's great. You guys wanna find a great contractor. When it comes to fixing and flipping, you guys have to understand, you don't have to put your own money up, okay? There's many strategies that you guys can get these properties, get um, some cash lenders so that you guys can obtain the property. They'll give you like a six to eight month duration in which you have to pay them back and they get an interest, but you come in, you renovate, and then you can flip it. This is something that you can make anywhere from 20 to 30,000 just quick, all right? So it's gonna take you probably about a month and a half to get your fix and flip complete, but this is a great strategy, all right? The next one we have is standard rental, all right? So you guys can buy a home, um, buy even an apartment and list that for rent. You don't have to fix it up, spruce it up, do anything crazy, you don't have to have a cleaner. You just kind of let it do what it do. You have a mortgage on it, mortgage might be 800 to 1,000, and then you charge 1,500. Nothing wrong with this, um, not big on the monthly income, but it is something good to build the equity in the home. And then once you're done um, retaining all of those profits, you can actually get a good check at the end. Then we have wholesale, all right? So Jeff is gonna touch on wholesaling. Wholesaling is great. You guys can actually do this without putting money into your pocket and make great spreads, all right? So I'm gonna save that for Jeff so that he can touch on that because he is a specialist in that. Then we have selling homes. So we have a few real estate agents here. Of course, we know if you sell those homes, you guys are getting anywhere from three to 6%. And then we have tax deed and tax lien investing. If you guys do not know about this, this is something that is honestly not talked about enough. You guys can get properties at tax deed auctions for pennies on the dollar, all right? So the county is going to host an auction, all right? They're gonna foreclose the property and the starting bid is only gonna be what they owed in taxes. So if somebody has a $300,000 home and they owe probably $5,000 in taxes, that's gonna be the opening bid. So now you're gonna be there with other investors competing with them so that you can get that property. So when you buy a property at the tax deed, when you win that bid, that property is yours immediately. Now tax lien is very similar, okay? So the difference between tax deed and tax lien is at tax lien, you're gonna pay their taxes and now you have interest, okay? So you're gonna pay for the taxes, okay? And then you're gonna start accruing interest, all right? They're gonna give you a redemption period in which the previous owner can pay you so they can get their property back. But if they don't, you can now get the property for a very low amount. I've seen people get half a million dollar homes for literally $20,000, all right? It, I am not joking with you guys. This is something that needs to be talked about more. So tax lien investing is a great way that you guys can get in real estate. And the good thing is you can have success just by trying. You guys can buy property for like, Maybe sometimes if you are in a, a lower area, maybe Arkansas, you can get something for a couple hundred, but if you're in Florida, you might get something for a couple thousand, and then the property is worth more. Once you obtain that deed, you can go ahead and flip it and make quick cash. You can then renovate it. You can also list it on Airbnb, so there's many options. Then we have surplus funds, all right? And this is what I specialize in, and this is honestly the secret to real estate. This is what, uh, primarily what I do. It. I help people after foreclosures. So just like those tax deed and tax lien, the county is gonna be hosting the auction. 
when the county holds the auction, the opening bid is gonna be the taxes that were owed and the property is gonna sell for a much higher amount. But what people do not know is that profit that's in between is due to the previous owner, all right? So my company, we reach out to them, we explain to them, hey, there's funds available for you at the county level, we can help you file, I get 15 to 30%. All right, so I've been making six figures in this business for the last two to three years in this, and I teach many students and they're having success. So surplus funds is something that you guys can get started in. So these are great real estate strategies. Once we are done with this, we can touch on this. Um, when we're having dinner, guys, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a personal chef that's catering everything. We have an open bar, so it's definitely gonna be a great time. But network, guys, get with people who are doing things that you wanna do, all right? Then I'm going to touch on this really quickly. Okay, investing strategies, all right? I'm not here to talk about crypto or anything like that, guys. This is going to be real investments that can help you, especially if you're a business owner, all right? So if you guys are a business owner, some of these things that I'm going to tell you are going to actually help you out, all right? Once we're done with this, um, you guys have the flyer. My CPA is going to come in and really help you out for all the business owners. So we have an IRA, all right? A lot of people hear about IRAs, but they don't even know what the hell it is, all right? IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account, okay? So if you're under 50, you can contribute $6,000 a year from your income, okay? That 6,000 is not gonna be taxable. What you're doing is you're gonna take those funds, you're gonna put it into a financial vehicle, that money is now tax deferred, meaning you are not paying taxes on it until you receive that money, all right? The thing about this is you can't touch it until 59 and a half because it's meant for retirement, or you're gonna have a penalty, all right? So if you guys don't have an IRA right now, don't think that this is something for, all right, when I'm 40, when I'm 50, because if you start now, we have the power of compounding, all right? And the thing is, we wanna strategize now so that when we are older, we don't have to work at Walmart greeting people. We don't have to work at Publix bagging. We don't have to do all of that. We wanna live life, all right? So today, we are here to show you guys that now is the best time. We're gonna really live life. Then we have the Roth IRA. Roth IRA is very powerful, all right? So we hear about this. A lot of people don't really know what it is, all right? A lot of people think the Roth IRA is gonna allow them to deduct taxes, things like that. That's kind of false, all right? With the Roth IRA, that's the same as the IRA, but you're paying your taxes now, okay? The good thing about paying your taxes now is this money is gonna grow tax-free. So if you start young and you pay your taxes now, by the time you get 59, you're gonna have a huge retirement that is completely tax-free, all right? So the Roth IRA is great. Once again, if you're under 50, we can only contribute 6,000, but I have some strategies for you guys, all right? We have the 401k, solo 401k. If you, any of you guys are employed, you have an employer, you probably have a 401k, all right? We don't know much about 401ks, we just kinda know that, okay, our company is taking care of it for us. I'm pretty sure you guys have checked it this year. The stock market is dropping. But the 401k is pretty good because you're thinking about the future, all right? But the solo 401k, if you guys are business owners, this is something that is actually a game changer, all right? When you have a solo 401k, let's say you guys are killing it in business and you're making a lot of income, you're gonna have to pay a lot of taxes. Trust me, we're gonna get into that in a little bit. When you make a lot of money, you're gonna have to pay a lot of taxes. But what you can do is you can open a solo 401k and you can contribute a lot more than you can contribute to an IRA or a Roth IRA. You can, every year I put in 32,000 into my solo 401k. So by the time I turn 59, it's gonna be outrageous. This is transferring money that I have to pay the government regardless into a financial vehicle that is gonna give me some returns, all right? So with that 32,000 that I'm putting towards this, instead of paying the IRS the 32,000, that's now going into that solo 401k, all right? This is going to be gaining interest because it's gonna be into investments. And you, if you guys really love crypto, you can do that, but honestly, I put mine into some safe investments, but the solo 401k, if you guys are a business owner and you do not have that, get with me after this and I can strategize everything for you, all right? Then we have life insurance, all right? We all hear about life insurance, but usually when it's too late, all right? We have loved ones that pass away and then now you're left with that burden to take care of them. Life insurance is very important. It's just something that you guys can have in the arsenal, okay? Because today we're gonna go over a lot of strategies and we wanna make sure we're prepared for everything, especially if you have loved ones. Even if you don't, you know in the future you will. And this is how the rich keep getting rich, all right? They transfer wealth and they keep passing on wealth. So there's a difference. We have term life insurance. 
that's when you're probably paying, we're young now, you guys can get a, literally a $2 million policy paying $100 a month. If you want something lower, you could probably pay like 20, 30, but you're just paying and then if you pass away, that'll be paid out. But they have a thing that's called an IUL, which is an Index Universal Life. All right, you guys might have heard about this on social media. I'll break this down in the most simple term possible, all right? And an IUL, it's gonna be just like that Roth IRA, all right? The only cool thing about this is we can touch this before 59 and a half, all right? And that Roth IRA, we're gonna get penalized, okay? And the IUL, you can do the same thing because it's growing tax-free, just like the Roth IRA. You can now put more money, you can access your money, and you're gonna have a higher death benefit. And the crazy thing about this is if you guys have a lot of money you can put into this, I do real estate, so I, I use my IUL kind of like my own bank. So if I put money into this product, I can now access 40% of those funds, take it out. If I pass away, they're gonna deduct it from the death benefit. If not, I can pay it back, all right? So this is a loan that you can take out from yourself that you don't have to pay it back. You're not obligated to pay it back. So the IUL is very powerful. Um, like I said, it's something that you wanna have into your strategy for life because we want to make sure that, for starters, we're making enough money, but then we also wanna make sure that our loved ones are gonna be straight. Then we have the stock market. I'll be honest, guys, when you're young, you wanna get started now. Even the market has been dropping, this is the time to get in and actually make money. Now, what you get in, that's gonna be up to you, all right? They have some people that are killing it in certain things, but if you wanna keep it basic, you don't really know what to do, S&P 500. Okay, the S&P 500 is gonna have the top 500 companies in America. On average, in the last 20 years, I think, Henry, what is it at, like 11.5% that it's been at? Yeah, so that's something that's consistent, but of course it goes up and down. But don't think of, okay, I need returns now, think of the future, all right? So these are some strategies that you guys can use to actually make some money on your money. All right, it's 7.59 now, so one second, I'm gonna bring on my CPA on Zoom, and then he's gonna go over some tax deduction tips, all right? So if you guys are making money right now, we know we're gonna have to pay the IRS, all right? And to be honest, I don't like paying the IRS, okay? I do not like paying the IRS. Who wants to make 100,000 and then have to pay the IRS 30-something thousand, you know? So we're gonna go over some ways so you guys can keep that money in your pocket, all right? One second. We'll cut this volume up. Say something real quick, Bradley, so I can make sure we can hear you good. I'm, I'm right here, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Awesome, okay. All right, so we have everybody here today and we have been talking about some real estate strategies, investment strategies. We have some investors here, we have some entrepreneurs, we have some business owners, and we really want to know some tax deduction tips because the IRS, we, we want to figure out how we can pay them as less as possible and we can dump more money into our business so we can have growth. So if you could share a few gems for us, we all have notebooks, we have our pen and paper, we are ready to learn from you, Bradley. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I hope that I say something of interest to some of y'all. Um, uh, Eric has asked me to talk a little bit about uh, what a tax deduction is and how they uh, help us and that kind of thing. And if you're in business, the, the beauty of this is, is a tax deduction just reduces the, the income and reduces the down to profit. So the lower profit that we can come up with, the lower that we're gonna pay tax. And most of you, if you're, if you're business owners, you pay two different kinds of tax. You pay an income tax and social security tax. Uh, the income tax, th that bracket depends on how much income uh, that you have. And the more income you have, the higher bracket that you're in. Uh, but the Social Security is a flat 15.3% bracket. So it, for every deduction we can come up with, we're going to save whatever the, the percentage that we're in on a bracket, and we're going to save that 15%. So it can be substantial uh, as to how much we save with the deduction. I will tell you with a, a business deduction, uh, what you can, it's pretty much whatever the imagination is as to what you can deduct. But I tell my clients, if you spend money so that you can make money, then most likely it is deductible. Now, that's, that's a general rule. There are exceptions to every rule, uh, but that's gonna be the general rule that you can pretty much hang your hat on. 
if you spend it so you can make it, then that is deductible. Now, I have had some people say, well, I've got to eat breakfast in order for me to, uh, to make money that day, or I won't have enough energy. Well, you'd have to eat breakfast whether you had a, a, a business or not. So that's not going to be deductible. Um, so they're, they're certainly within reason there. But if you, for instance, I don't need to rent an office if I didn't have a, a business. I had to rent that office in order to have that business, so therefore it is deductible. Any questions on deductions, or do I need to add, uh, mention anything else about well, it? Well, that was great that you touched on that, and I, I really want everybody to understand that putting money back into your business is what's going to grow, okay? Bradley always comes to me. He, he tells me my tax bill, and I'm like, damn, I got to pay a lot of money to the IRS. And he's like, yeah, you got a lot of money you need to spend. but. It needs to be spent on your business. When you put that money back into your business, you're gonna have more growth, okay? And it makes complete sense, all right? We have to spend this money regardless, whether it's the IRS or on your business, why not put it towards your business so you can expand? You guys should not be making money and like, okay, let me just hoard it and save it all. You, money is a currency. Current means it's constantly flowing. So we need to put our money back into our business all right, it's gonna be a deduction. It's gonna be something that you wanna do anyway. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, thank you, Bradley. So that's, that's one thing, we have a general idea on deductions. What are some ideas or examples of deductions for a business owner that you know, has a high tax bill? What are some examples that I can do? I know one thing that you put me on is going to be the vehicle weighing more than 6,000 pounds. Okay. Well, that's certainly one deduction that I talk to my clients about is uh, travel expenses and, and a vehicle expense and, and the expense of owning a vehicle. There are two ways that you can deduct your vehicle expense. One way is if the company owns it and the other way is if you own that vehicle. Uh, so let me talk to you about the two ways and then you decide which way is gonna give you the biggest deduction and that determines who is going to own that vehicle. So one way is, is if the company owns it. If the company owns the vehicle, then the company gets to deduct all of the expenses for that vehicle. The gas, the insurance, the car washes, the oil changes, the depreciation, everything. All of that is 100% deductible. However, if you use that vehicle for personal use, then you have to back out the value of that personal use. Now I've used two terms here that mean something totally different to me, but may not to you. And that is cost and value. We are gonna deduct the cost of owning that vehicle, but we're gonna back out the value of the personal use of that vehicle. Value is always higher than cost. So if you use that vehicle uh, a, a lot for personal use, it may be that the value is greater than the cost and therefore uh, we get no ben, uh, ben, uh, benefit or deduction out of the use of that vehicle. Um, that method works very well if you don't drive a lot of miles and you use it 100% for business. Uh, if that's the case, then most likely you'll get a bigger deduction using the actual expense method. Most of my clients, however, use the mileage method. The mileage method is if you own the vehicle, that would be the method you're required to use. So in essence, what happens is, is your company comes to you and says, look, I don't have any arms and legs and I don't have a voice. I can't talk to customers. Uh, I want to hire you to do those things. And you say, well, great. I have arms and legs and a, a voice. I can talk to customers. I would love to work with you. Um, but how am I going to get around? Do you have a car for me? They're going to say, no, nope, I don't have a car for you. We require you to use your car, but we will reimburse you for the miles that you drive for business use. That's when the company is going to uh, uh, reimburse you uh, the, the amount for personal use. Now, the IRS says if you reimburse the amount that we authorize or a lesser amount, then the amount that's reimbursed, we don't have to put on your W-2 and you don't have to report it as income. Uh, in 21, that amount was 56 cents a mile. Uh, 22, I think they went up a little bit, a, a penny or two, because gas was so high. Um, 
but whatever that rate is, that's what the IRS or, or what your company can reimburse you, and you don't have to pay tax on it, but the company gets to deduct that. Now, we have found for most of our clients, if they have a reasonable car, twenty or $30,000 car, and they drive more than, than 10,000 miles for business, they'll probably get a better deduction using the mileage method than they would if they use the actual expense method. Now, if you had a dump truck, that's not going to work. If you're driving a $90,000 car around, that's probably not going to work. But if you just got a regular car, you can probably get the higher deduction. Now, what uh, Eric was talking about, a 6,000 pound car, is that if it's 6,000 pounds or less, then um, the IRS calls those a luxury vehicle. Now, luxury, when it first came out, indicated that these were very expensive cars. But that's not the case these days. The, the way they define luxury has nothing to do with the cost or the value of the car. It has everything to do with the weight. So they have, they have really limited the amount of depreciation that you can take on these luxury vehicles. If, you, if your vehicle is more than that, uh, then they uh, re, uh, have higher caps on it. And if it's too much, then they don't even have any caps on that depreciation. So if you have a, a, a heavier vehicle, uh, then you can deduct more per year on that depreciation. So, so th that's about what's going on with those vehicles. So whichever way is gonna give you the biggest deduction, that's who we want to own that, that vehicle. Awesome, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, how I did that with my Porsche because it's over 6,000 pounds. Now, um, can you touch on how much taxes you can save if you are a real estate owner? What are some deductions that you can get as someone who has a rental property or things like that? Because everybody in this room is interested in real estate. Um, we have people who are already doing it, have properties on Airbnb, uh, do some rentals, things like that. So can you touch on some deductions that you can get and the tax benefits of being a real estate owner? Yeah. Uh, there are really going to be two kinds of, of uh, properties that we can um, uh, own. One is in, one in which you provide personal services and substantial personal services, and one is which you are not. An Airbnb, uh, let me give you a, a good example of how the pendulum swings both ways. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the pendulum all the way to the left and all the way to the right. As it gets towards the middle, it gets a little confusing. Uh, but that's why the tax courts are so full because there's a lot of gray area in tax law. If you go to a motel, that is rental property. Um, uh, no question, I'm renting that room for the night, maybe for even a couple of nights, but I'm not renting that room for a year. And with that room, I'm getting some services. I have some maid services come in. They're gonna make the bed for me in the morning. Uh, they're gonna put out some new soap for me. They're gonna give me some more shampoo. They're gonna vacuum the floor. They're doing a lot of stuff for me. I'm not just renting that room. Um, however, on the other side of that pendulum is I, have, I can own a house and I'm gonna rent that house uh, and I'm gonna have a year's lease with my tenants. I'm not ever gonna go over there until that tenant says, my toilet is running, send somebody over to fix this or some other problems going on. And they're gonna send me the check and I don't really have to do anything. So the, the difference of the two is, is if you're in long-term rentals and you don't provide any services, uh, then you have a, a uh, rental situation. Um, it's, it's gonna be called passive, uh, not passive, um, what do we call that? Um, oh geez, I tell you, it's tough getting old. You start to lose your memory on things. I believe it is passive, passive losses. Passive losses have some limitations, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other side of that, um, that coin is, is this motel that I'm talking about because I'm providing personal services. Many Airbnbs do that, uh, where they're providing those personal services, or bed and breakfast where they're providing those personal services. When those personal services get in there, now we've got a business. This is not passive income anymore. This is active income. And we've got really two tax scenarios on both of those. 
So I'll talk about the passive one first, and then we'll talk about the active one second. In the passive uh, scenario, where you're just renting and you've got a long-term tenant and you're not providing any services, uh, we normally just report that on our personal tax return. It goes on Schedule E, and we report there the income and the expenses that we generate. Now again there, uh, the income is pretty self-explanatory, but what kind of expenses can we deduct? Well, any expenses that, <clears throat> that we incur to, to earn that income. Uh, as at a, a minimum, we would have interest expense, uh, insurance expense, um, uh, property taxes. We may even have some uh, utilities that we have to pay. Uh, maybe we pay an HOA fee, uh, those kinds of things. So, so you kind of determine what expenses do I incur so that I can generate that income? Now, the, the, the positive with that is, is that income is, is considered passive income, which means we pay income tax on it, but we do not pay Social Security tax. So that 15% Social Security tax that we talked about earlier that businesses have to pay, these rental properties do not have to pay that 15%. So that's a great thing. The negative with that is this, if we have losses, those losses are going to be limited. Uh, they are limited to $25,000 for most people. Uh, so you can deduct up to $25,000 of those losses against any other kinds of income. But if you lose more than that, you cannot deduct that. What the, and what the IRS, and now you're not just losing it, we just can't deduct it this year. So what the IRS calls that is these non-deductible losses are called suspended losses, which means that ne they're suspended till next year. And we'll go through that same calculation again and we're limited to $25,000. So in year one, let's say that we have a $30,000 loss. We deduct 25,000 against our other incomes this year and 5,000 is suspended. Next year, let's say that we have a $15,000 loss plus our 5,000 suspended loss equals 20,000 total. Since it's less than 25,000, we can deduct the entire 20,000 next year. Now, for many situations, that, uh, that loss continues to carry over. Now, we never throw that loss away. That, that loss is deductible in one of two situations. One, is if we make income, then we can deduct that loss against that income. Just as I described with my $15,000 loss plus my 5,000 suspended loss, now I get to deduct that. The second scenario is, is when I dispose of that prop property. So if I finally sell it and I've got this big suspended loss, now I can deduct that loss against that, that profit that I've made. And, and that profit it may be substantial profit as a capital gain, and, but it may not really cost me a lot because I've got all those suspended losses that I get to deduct now as well. Yes, and Bradley, so I'm, selling, of, I'm selling. Should, should I of, stop now to, for you to make a comment or should I talk about this if we have some uh, significant services? We, we can get into that in a second. I like what you said about the capital gains kind of offsetting that with our losses because I'm gonna be selling one of my properties soon and that capital gains are really high. So this is important guys. Once you start getting into these rentals, things like that, you know, we always have to have an exit strategy, okay? And when we end up selling our homes, of course you want to have your profits. It's very important to get with a CPA who knows all these things so now we can keep more money in our pockets because we're able to deduct those losses. I just, uh, I really enjoyed that, Bradley. Also, um, we have a lot of young investors here. Do you have any type of um, just advice in terms of tax deductions for the, the, the new business owners, things like that, getting started? Should they get with a CPA like you or should, is TurboTax something that's gonna be good enough for them? Any type of advice in terms of that? You know, I think it depends on what kind of expenses that you have as an investor. Uh, many people sit in, their, sit in a room in front of a computer and they make investments. Uh, there are two ways that we can deduct the expenses of these investments. One is we just don't deduct them at all. 
uh, if, if I were an investor such that I um, uh, invested in stocks and maybe I was a day trader, so I'd, I'd buy a stock today and a couple of days later I would sell that stock. Uh, or in options where I would I would buy or sell an option and then wait to you know either reverse that that transaction uh, sometime later or just let it expire and hopefully it expires to my good so I kept all that profit. Uh, all of those things, uh, all of those profits and losses are going to be netted together and they're going to be reported on your personal tax return. Um, and you're either going to have a capital gain, a net capital gain, or a net capital loss. Uh, the, the, if you have long-term losses, then we have some benefits as to the taxation of those long-term. But if you're a day trader, you're never going to have anything that's long-term because long-term is defined that I've had it for more than a year, a, a year and a day in order for it to be long-term. Now, if that's the situation, and you're a short-term investor, then you're gonna put it all on Schedule D and whatever the profit is you get to deduct and whatever the loss is you get to deduct. However, that loss is gonna be limited to $3,000. So if we, if, we're gonna, if we choose that road, then we deduct no expenses from my computer, from my internet, from my office in my home, that kind of thing. Now, okay. Now, we, th there, that's that's something very important that you're, you're you're sharing right now, Bradley. And I want them to really understand this. If you're somebody who's a day trader, you're telling me that the computer, the office space, any type of um, technology that we need to actually do this is deductible. Correct? No. No, it is not. Okay. It is not deductible. There's oh. another way we can do it where we can deduct those things. Oh, that's another way. Okay, Sh shed the light on that. So the computer and stuff like that that we're trading on is not deductible. If you're going to report it and it goes on Schedule D mm -hmm. on your tax return, if you report it that way, you get to deduct none of your expenses. Uh -huh. There is a way that we can deduct those expenses, but there's some negatives and some positives with that. And you need to kind of balance those two and say, which is going to be the best way for me? So if you want to deduct those expenses, this is what we would do. We would say that we are in the business of investing. Now, that goes on your personal return with a Schedule C. Schedule C is where we report business expenses. If you are a yard maintenance guy, if you're a plumber, if you're an accountant, if you're a whatever, if you, whatever business you have, if you run a 7-Eleven, all of that stuff goes on a Schedule C. On a Schedule C, we report our income and our expenses. If I were an investor, I would put on Schedule C my profits that I made on that, on my real estate investing. But now I'm gonna deduct other things. I've got an office in my home, so I get to deduct my home office expenses. The way that works is, is the home office expenses are the expenses that it takes me to operate my home. For example, to operate my home, I have to pay interest, and I pay uh, taxes, and I pay insurance, and I pay utilities, and I pay somebody to cut my grass, and I have homeowners association fees. I have all those expenses. Those are expenses to run my home. Not necessarily my office, but my home. So what I do is I take the square footage of my office over the square footage of my home, come up with the percentage, and I multiply it times all those expenses, and I get to deduct those expenses against my, my uh, business income. In addition to that, I have other expenses, such as I may have travel expenses. I certainly have internet expenses. I have cell phone expenses. I have a, a computer and a printer that I have to buy. I have to put uh, paper and in, in, um, uh, toner in that printer. So now if I want to deduct all those expenses, I can do it. The positive with that is it allows me to deduct all those expenses. The negative is, is that now I have an active trader business, which means that I have to pay income tax on that money and I, I have to pay social security tax on that money. Now, that, so that's the negative. Another benefit is 
is if I have a loss, I get to deduct my loss. If I'm an investor and I have a loss, I do not, I only get to deduct $3,000 of my loss. So the two options you have if you're an investor is you can, you can uh, uh, report it as an investor, which means everything goes on Schedule D, which means you report the sale minus the cost. That's all you get to report. If you report it as a business, you'll put it on Schedule C and you'll report the sale minus the cost do not, you don't have to worry about limitations of losses. You get to deduct all the losses and you get to deduct your home office expense and all the other expenses that you incur to generate that income. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much, Bradley. We're short on time. We're going to get to our next speaker. So thank you so much for sharing all of that knowledge on tax deductions. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Bye. I use that strictly for business. I have a car that I have on Toro, so that's completely tax deductible, and I was able to save on taxes by getting that vehicle. So if you guys are any type of high earners, you wanna get these vehicles, my boy Josh, he got a Range Rover, he did the same thing. You get those vehicles that are higher, you're good. Now one thing for you real estate investors, it was, he touched on it briefly, but interest payments, okay? Your interest payments and your insurance on your rental properties. If you guys are somebody who wants to get into real estate, you don't have a lot of money, but you have an LLC, this is a gem for you guys, you guys can get a home that is gonna be approved strictly on the earning potentials of that property, all right? So if you have a property and it's like 300,000, 400,000, and the monthly payments come out to 1,500, 1,600, but you can get a rental income that is a lot higher you're gonna get approved for that property, all right? There's some lenders who will even let you get that with zero money down, all right? You're gonna have scenarios where you guys can get into this. If you get that property with an interest-only payment, you are now able to deduct all of them, all right? So if you have a property, I'll give you guys an example. I bought a duplex, all right? The duplex has a monthly payment of 3,200. All right, 3,200, this is interest only, so I do not have to pay any form of taxes on that. I can deduct that, all right? So that property is bringing in seven to $8,000 a month on Airbnb, all right? So that can be four to $5,000 in profit, and now I can deduct that mortgage payment. If you guys have principal and interest, you can only deduct your interest. So if you have the principal on that 3,200 for that same scenario, and it's, let's say 2,800, now that's not something that you can deduct, all right? So if you guys are new into real estate, definitely get with me after this. I'll explain to you guys how you guys can get some of those tax benefits. Now we're gonna bring Josh to, um, up here. So Josh is actually killing it right now in tech. So I'm gonna let him just share a little bit of his success and, and how he's killing it right now. So give it up for Josh. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Josh Coffey. I run an IT consulting firm uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. It's called Catalyst Tech Solutions. And pretty much what we do is uh, we're, we're responsible for the IT implementations, um, development, um, and all type of IT needs for government, finance, healthcare, uh, insurance, whatever that looks like. We have the, and the platform that I develop for and maintain is called ServiceNow. Uh, many of you probably have heard of ServiceNow or our competitor, Salesforce. Uh, all you have to do is, you know, go on the, the uh, Yahoo Finance and check out the stock price and you can see they're doing very well. Uh, so with that, I, how I got into IT consulting is from, I went on Udemy and did a, you know, three to six month course but my background started in finance. I went to school, I played football in college, uh, played sports like my brother Eric, and uh, went from there and I, I saw, you know, finance was, was a great degree, you know. Uh, I had to, you know, put on a suit and uh, look the part, you know, and sit in this desk and, you know, go through, you know, all type of pro formas and things of that nature. And, you know, I'm an investment analyst and, you know, just doing the thing, 22 year old life, 23, and I'm like, okay, all right, put on a suit every day. All right, this is not it. I gotta find something to break through. You know, what, where's that breakthrough? And uh, I, you know, of course, I knew a lot of people that were in IT. I have family members that are in IT, uh, auntie, grandmother, you know, and I knew they lived, you know, luxurious lifestyle and had the ability to work from home. 
Uh, and so with that, that was a key, that was key in me implementing, you know, uh, you know, of course on the platform of service now, but just jumping into the IT industry. Uh, so with that, I have been able to scale in two years to have 10, now 10 IT contracts with, you know, numerous, you know, consumers uh, and end users such as, you know, Wells Fargo, uh, Virgin Islands government, which I travel there, you know, quite frequently. Um, I've had, you know, CDC contract and numerous other government contracts. Uh, with that, I uh, also help, you know, train people up and get them into, you know, IT because with IT, we think that it is something that is outside of our wheelhouse or a space that is like, I have to be this extreme coder, and that's actually not the case. So on ServiceNow, it's a low code, a no code. What's a typical contract looking like? Typical contract for me uh, will be like minimum 130K. Okay. That's on the developer side of things. But I've switched from developing to running a consulting firm because me being the businessman I am, I wanted to cut off the middleman uh, because one, they're taking money off my table and I said, they're doing something that I have the ability to do as well. Uh, so I cut the middleman out uh, with the recruiters and now I manage the entire contracts myself. So I bid, I do a statement of work, I you know, send those out to government. I, of course, me being, and there's a lot of minorities in the room, there's money out there in IT that they're dumping into, you know, they have millions just sitting out there waiting for you to come get it. You know, so with that, when I saw that, done my research, you know, reached out to and networked with numerous people in the IT space, I took that, you know, and ran with it. So um, I've been doing that now for two, two and a half years, and I've been able to scale, you know, more remarkably. Um, but with that, I, I, I take it and really show people, okay, IT, you can take and get onto the ServiceNow platform and become a you know ServiceNow administrator or developer in three to six months, right? Of course, you're gonna you know equip yourself with the mental assets that you need. Of course, courses, seminars, you know, uh, of course, grabbing mentors, and there's numerous training courses. Of course, we provide that as well. But with that, you can change you know the outcome of your life and change the trajectory of your life in three to six months. You know, of course, uh, you know most people are making money doing you know other things in other in industries, but there's every year 500,000 IT jobs that go you know, unfilled. Yeah. So there's space and opportunity. Uh, so that's, you know, really my background. And um, like I said, I've been, I've been doing that for a while and, you know, assisting numerous people across, you know, the, the world and also partnering with, you know, numerous corporations in, you know, India uh, and, you know, outsourcing majority of my work. So when I get the contract, I'm looking to, you know, make 25 to 50% market rate on the contract, you know, so I took, you know, the middleman out and then I became my own middleman. So uh, that's really valuable uh, for me because it's keeping money in my pocket. Obviously, you know, we had the, the CPA talk, so uh, that's very, really valuable as well. So uh, that's... Touch on the success at a young age and why now is a good time. Yes. Um, every day that we wake up, we, we have numerous distractions that are thrown our way. Instagram, you know, uh, TV shows, Netflix, and things of that nature. And uh, me, I'm 26, I just turned 26, I was in Dubai for two weeks. Uh, I need a tax write off one. Uh, so we spent that time out there, but the time has always been now. We gotta, we gotta, every day we wake up, we gotta hit the snooze button on distractions. You know, whether that be put your phone away for 30 to 45 minutes so you can have, you know, a really intense, you know, 30 to 45 minutes where your focus is hell, you know, on whatever task, you're at hand, you know, so uh, with all of us, you know, seem to be young, y'all look very beautiful, you know, handsome individuals. We really have to maximize our existence. Uh, and with that, like I said, we have numerous distractions. We just got to, you know, be intentional with what we do and how we spend our time, you know, not to be cliche, but, you know, how I broke into IT, I, I was in finance, like I said, and I, every, every day after work, one to two hours, I was studying on Udemy. Like, this course is very hands-on, so what I'm learning, I'm going and, you know, I have a developer instance where I'm copying pretty much what this guy is showing me in the training videos. So I actually have that, that practicum, that experience that is needed when I break in and, and get into these interviews of these, you know, developer roles. So uh, the time is always now, you know, we always, you know, we see on Instagram, we see these people living this luxury life, luxurious lifestyle that's out there for us as well, you know private jets, nice cars, whatever you want, it's out there for you. Just be very intent with your time, 
and limit distractions. Awesome, man. Yes, starve your distractions. All right, we're gonna have Jeff come up. He's gonna give you guys some game, all right? When it comes to real estate, there's something that you guys probably don't even know about that he's gonna touch on. Give a round of applause for Eric for setting this up, guys. God, me. Everybody looks beautiful today, you know. Um, you know, without Eric, you know, I'm, I'm just happy to, you know, be here speaking at this event because, you know, the power of doing more is very important, right? And I feel like everybody has the ability to be successful in anything that they do. Um, but I just want to get into it. You know, my name is Jeff Altador. I'm a 27-year-old real estate investor, serial entrepreneur. You know, I do a lot. Um, but my main niche is wholesaling real estate, right? Um, and usually when you hear wholesaling guys, you hear the, you know, the traditional way, wholesaling houses, you know, where you find a, a discounted property or a rundown property where, you know, you type in the seller or whatever, you try to reach out to the homeowner um, and you try to assign that contract over to an end buyer, right? Um, but what I do is a lot easier than that, right? Because when you hear wholesaling houses, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of difficult, right? Because when I first got into it, um, I hated it, right? Um, I was wholesaling houses for like the first three, four, four months um, without no pay. I didn't close no deal. Um, and I was like, damn, bro, like, is wholesaling houses really, like, does this work, right? Because I was actually questioning myself. Um, but then when I ran into something else, which literally caught my eye and it was the easiest transition that I ever made um, was wholesaling land, right? Um, which is the same, same, literally the same, same strategy uh, where you find an off-market property and you assign that to an end buyer. Um, but the thing with wholesaling land, what made it so, so easy and so basically easy to transition to was that I didn't have to calculate any bathrooms or roofs or toilets, right? Literally, it was just a piece of dirt, right? So what I did was find that piece of dirt and wholesaled it to a, a big time developer around the area, right? Which a lot of people, I know you guys probably live in, you know, areas where there's a lot of home builders around um, that are currently building. And those guys, right? Those are the people that I work with, right? Who I usually wholesale my land over to, which is the home builders. Right, and um, the strategy that we use is called the Builders First Strategy, right? Um, and what we do, we actually reach out to builders around the area that are currently building new construction houses, and we try to reach out to them and basically see, hey, are you guys still, you know, currently still looking for infill lots to, you know, build houses on? Um, and majority of the time, yes, they are. And the thing with these home builders, right, guys, they don't have people to really go out there and kind of look for lots for them because they're their main focus is buying a bulk load of lots, right? And they wanna make sure that they hit their quotas. So they love working with people like me and yourselves, right? If you guys were ever interested in getting started, um, these people are out there waiting for you to literally bring them deals. Um, but, you know, when I came across wholesaling land right after, you know, my, my terrible, terrible debut of wholesaling houses, the minute I transitioned to wholesaling land, I closed my first deal in literally a week, right? And that was the easiest, literally the easiest deal I ever done in my life. Um, Cause literally what I did was find a piece of land, connected that with the end buyer who was actually building in the area. And literally a week later, as soon as the title was free and clear, I made my first 5K in literally less than seven days. And right then and there, I knew it was real, right? Um, and just to give you a little bit background on me, you know, I'm a, um, you know, Division one Hooper. Uh, and when I was done playing college basketball, I didn't really know what to do. Um, I was, you know, trying to look for the next big thing as far as, you know, figuring out, um, cause I kind of didn't want to go the overseas route um, because I know the pay was, was trash. You know, I didn't kind of want to waste my time. Um, so, you know, I ended up finding a, a, a pretty good decent nine to five where I was working at Enterprise Car Rental. Um, and from there, I actually learned sales. Right, um, and, and to be honest, I was kind of natural at sales um, and really talking with people. Um, but when I was working there, man, literally, I kid you not, <laughs> I was going crazy. And, and when I realized that, wow, 
you know, the amount of work, the amount of people that I'm talking to just to make $15 an hour, it didn't make sense, right? Because I, I knew I had a skill um, when I was working at the airport, right? And I was a, I'm a hustler, guys, right? When I was working at the airport, literally, I kid you not, there would be people coming in, and, you know, just because I has, you know, you know, just because I have really good words and I'm good with my wording, I was able to literally sell these rental cars to people and, and make money on the side while I'm making $15 an hour. But that's when it hit me and I was like, yo, dude, you know, I, I think I'm bigger than this nine to five, right? And then after COVID, that's when I jumped into wholesaling land full time. Um, but, you know, just to give you a background on that, um, but now, you know, now we're here in 2022, I run a six figure month land flipping company. Um, where I have nine employees, and basically we wholesale land nationwide, right, to home builders. Um, and, and honestly, it's been a blessing and a life changing. I started this two years ago, and to you know to be where I'm at now is honestly a blessing. Um, and I and I truly, truly believe that wholesaling land is the easiest way to get into real estate. You don't need a license, right? I don't have a license, guys. You don't need credit um, because they don't check that, right? What you need when you're jumping into wholesaling, you just need work ethic, guys, right? And to make time to make those calls, right? And I, I kind of wanted to show you guys exactly what I do, but you know, I guess you know we had some technical difficulties, but it's all good. But if you guys are looking to connect out there and, you, and if you're interested in getting into real estate, wholesaling land is the easiest way to get into because, like I said, it's it's no stress, little to no competition. Um, not a lot of wholesalers out here are doing it. I remember uh, my boy Eric, you know, he hit me up. I was posting deals at the deals on Instagram. He was like, yo, dude, like you're killing it. And I was killing it in his backyard in Fort Myers. And I don't even live there, right? All I was doing was flipping land to home builders in Cape Coral um, and literally connected with Eric and gave him the whole rundown. He was just, you know, shook, right? Because it's like, yo, this dude is flipping land and he doesn't even live here, right? And what we do it, right, we do it virtually, guys, right? You don't need to show up to the property. You don't need to walk the property. I'm in my boxes, guys, closing six-figure deals. Um, and, you know, it, I, can't, I can't, you know, sometimes it's hard to believe, but it, it's the truth, guys. And, and honestly, wholesaling land is probably the best way to get into real estate if you guys are looking to get into it. Yeah, so when I first got started, um, you know, at the time, I was using Zillow, right? Zillow.com, um, and it's free. Everybody has access to Zillow. Um, and on Zillow, which this is why I was trying to show you guys, I wanted to break it down, but it's all good. But on Zillow, if you go on for sale by owner, right, you wanna make sure you're filtering it out because there's tons of free leads on Zillow, and that's how I got started. Actually, Zillow funded my business, right, because, um, before I came, before I actually started doing it full time, um, I was working at Home Depot, literally making $200 an hour, guys. Like, I was down bad. Um, and, you know, during that time, on the side, I was literally just putting in work, just making sure that I'm able to grow this land business to where I gotta go, so that way I'm able to leave my nine to five to pursue this, right? And Zillow was the key, right? Because, mind you, I didn't really have that much money but I had time and I had energy and I had effort, right? And I had grit because I knew I wanted to get out my situation. So when I went on Zillow, right, what you want to do is basically filter out on Zillow for sale by owners. And then on the home type, you want to just put land and lots, right? It's only two filters that I use. Um, and you, you want to make sure you find an area, guys, where there's new construction going on. Right, that's very important because you don't want to go into an area where you know there's a lot of houses and you know there's not really that much infill lots around. So make sure you find an area where there's a lot of new construction going on. I know Fort Myers is a really good market, Cape Coral, uh, Lehigh Acres, um, Jacksonville. You know, we, we do deals all around Florida. Um, so you know, just I, I would make sure that you find an area where there's new construction going on and then you know, reach out to the builders in that area, right? Because it's important that you wanna reach out to the builders first because you wanna get the criteria that they need, right? What's the size, how much they're paying. And that's why I love wholesaling land because it's not that, cal you know, it's not that hard, right? Because these builders are giving you the criteria to actually go out and go fetch it for them, right? So um, 
that's that's basically you know what you what what I did to get started was go on Zillow, um, and literally Zillow funded my whole business. I didn't have any credit, no money, um, and usually, right with wholesaling, all you're doing is flipping paper, right? So as soon as you get the criteria from the builders, right now you want to go out and go find the sellers, right? And there's different ways you can do that. Zillow, uh, there's PropStream, uh, there's different softwares out there that you can use. Um, but Zillow definitely, you know, if you're if you're looking to get better on the phone and just practice, I would definitely abuse Zillow. There's tons of free leads on there. Um, I still use Zillow to this day because um, there's always deals on there. But um, Zillow is the best best way to get started for sure, 100%. But yeah, yeah. Do you currently have a course on this? Yes, I currently have a course. Um, we have uh, a land flipping our land flipping empire. Um, it's, it's actually one forty nine ninety nine a month, but it's private mentorship where, you know, we help our students and we actually close deals with our students as well. Um, and we actually pick the areas for them so that way they can, you know, come into our market and we actually help them and work them through the, each deal that, you know, they bring us and stuff like that. But, um, I want to say that, you know, when I first got started, guys, like it, it was it was really, really mind blowing because I, I didn't know how easy it was to make 10K. Right. Because I was working a nine to five and I didn't really know, you know, how to excel and make as much money in a short amount of time. Right. Because when I was working, right, I was making 40K a year, um, which I thought that was OK bread. But when I jumped into real estate, I was like, yo, 40K a year. I'm making 40K in a month, right, by myself. And that's when my mindset shifted because I knew that, yo, money money is a mindset. So when you think abundant, right, it literally comes to you as long as you're willing to put in the work. Um, and I can say that, yeah, real, wholesaling land is definitely the way to go. Um, it's very easy, like I said, no credit, no money, no background, right? All you have to do is literally open your laptop. And as long as you have a phone and a laptop and Wi-Fi, you can close deals anywhere, guys. Anywhere. I mean, I'm on, I'm on vacation closing deals, you know. So, um, you know, wholesaling land is definitely the way to go, guys. All right, guys. So, we've we'll be able to connect afterwards. I know we're gonna have a lot of questions for everybody who's speaking. We've given a lot of motivation and then strategies that you guys can apply now. We're gonna bring to the um, not the stage, we're gonna bring to speak, Chris. He's gonna share with you guys how to get business funding, how to build your business credit, because we all have these ideas, but a lot of us may not have the capital to move forward, all right? And when you can get this business funding, you're gonna be able to tie in your ideas with money and you can excel. So let's go ahead and give it up for Chris. He's gonna drop some gems for you guys. Hey everybody, um, so I'm gonna give a quick background introduction on myself and kind of how I got to where I am today. Even though the title of what I'm gonna be talking about is business funding, it's really going to be talking about leverage because that's what funding is. I'm gonna be talking about financial leverage, but also the leverage of people because that's really what a business or a corporation is. You're leveraging people to get the work done or um, continue on the vision of the company below you. Um, to give a quick background, I'm 25, I'm from Virginia. I went to college at ODU and I got two degrees, one's in cybersecurity and one's in IT. And I went this route because my parents weren't entrepreneurs. They only knew to go to college and get a job and to start making money that way from corporate America. The thing that I did that helped me out the most is I got a college credit card from Wells Fargo my freshman year and I put it on auto pay. When I was about to get the credit card, I didn't really know much about credit at the time, the banker asked me if I wanted to do um, automatic payments so I would never miss a payment. And at the time, I didn't have a lot of money, so I was like, no, no, thank you. She was like, at least put the minimum on, that way you don't miss the payment. The minimum payment most of the time was like 20 to $25 or something like that. So going throughout college, whenever I were, was like low on funds or something like that, need to use the credit card to buy groceries or something like that, the credit card just kept, I kept on using it over and over again. Then by the time I graduated, I had five years of positive payment history. And I also used my credit also to get a car as well. But I say that to say that six months out of college, I bought my first quadplex because of the credit that I established over that time. And that was kind of like my step into entrepreneurship. And after I bought the quadplex, I kind of stayed stagnant for a little while because I was content with my corporate job. I had an easy job, I was working an hour a day, I was making six figures, I was making money in my underwear, like he said. It, it was a very easy ride until I started meeting people that were real entrepreneurs and were making really good money. And that kind of like sparked motivation in me to do more. 
so what i did from there is i i took the time to spend a month learning about credit business credit and leverage because i knew that when you don't have money the way that you create money is through credit it's through leverage i knew that i had good credit and i knew that i needed leverage to do so so one of the options that i explored i had my product flex for about two years at that time i explored a heloc option a heloc is a home equity line of credit uh, depending on the uh, the variable interest rates um, in the market and things like that, it can change. But let's say you get a HELOC at three percent, um, you can you can get a secured loan against your property at three percent. And creative ways to how you can use that leverage money is you can lend the money out at a higher rate than you get it. So let's say that you get a HELOC against your primary home that you have two hundred thousand dollars in equity in. You're able to pull out sometimes up to 85 or 90 percent of that. I know Navy Federal they allow you to go up to 95 percent in your primary residence. It can't be an investment property for that. Investment properties are going to be a lower percentage because there's more of a risk. But let's say that you have a $200,000 HELOC, and let's say that you know friends that flip real estate. Let's say that it takes an average real estate flipper three months to flip a house. If let's say you lend that three percent money out to that real estate flipper at 12 percent, you're making a nine percent spread on that money. Let's say you lend out that $200,000 and you get that. 9% back after three months. Now you're starting to build up reserves. And after you do that three to four to five times, now you'll probably get to the point where you've replaced the entire initial $200,000 and now you're only lending out the money that you made, your profit. So you can, the, the best money is made in between. And I'm gonna try to cover a lot of different things because I feel like I have a lot to offer within the, the leverage space. So I'm um, probably gonna have to stop it from talking too long. But for a long time working corporate, I thought that I was lazy. I didn't like to work much. I found a job where I could make the most amount of money working the least amount of time. However, I felt like my mindset internally was to work smarter, not harder. I just hadn't put that to use yet. So when I first approached entrepreneurialism, um, I actually came across a friend that had a VA funnel. What I mean by that is he has a source where he finds virtual assistants that are very um, articulate, they're bilingual. Most of them have actually lived in the US for a good amount of time. So. I thought I took that same philosophy that the easiest and the best money is made in the middle because you have both sides of a business transaction. You have the business that buys it or the business that sells it, and then you have the business that buys it. The middle, just like wholesaling, you're just flipping the contract. You're not having to own either side of the business. You're not having to deal with the headaches of building the infrastructure up yourself. You're not having to deal with infrastructure and overhead and payroll and all these things that goes along with building and scaling a business. So I thought to myself, how can I make money while using the VAs to cold call and sell. So I started to think of the best strategies to, to give VA scripts on to cold call to sell products for me because that was a good way to make money in between. Um, something that could be an example of that is like solar panel sales. If you were to work out a, like a contract with a company to sell solar panels, maybe it's a smaller company that doesn't actually have a marketing department, you could call them and offer your sales as you know, your company um, for a commission. Uh, if you're looking at it from that perspective, the company has nothing to lose because you're only being paid on commission. So if they give you a chance to give you, let's say, a six-month contract that says that whatever sale that you bring them, your company gets 20% of it. You give your script to the VAs, you train your VAs on how to cold call and make those sales, and that way now you have a whole entire like marketing team below you. And um, to cover some of the business that I'm in now before I get too far, I have a autonomous wholesaling business where I use VAs and different CRMs and um, they all work hand in hand to actually take the entire real estate process from list pulling, lead gen, all the way from warm lead to close as well. So I have the entire wholesaling operation outsourced and I've never actually thought about doing that for land as well. So um, that's one of the ways that I've actually used the VAs. I also, I am a co-founder of a mobile auto glass repair company that's called InstaShield that is fairly new. Um, however, as of Five days ago, we had a very important meeting with Raystar Properties, and they've agreed to allow us to be their um, primary liaison for mobile auto glass at their, at, their, um, at their properties within the Atlanta region. So that was looking very promising so far, but I saw a lot of value in service-based business because of that. To go to the next thing, I'm also a co-founder of Logic.API, or we also call it Verify.API. Since I was in the real estate space, and I also own that quadplex and some other small investment properties, since then, I saw that there was a big need within the verification from the ident identity verification and financial verification space because of CPNs and other things that are going on. So my API and my software helps to verify a person's identity and financial documents instantaneously so that uh, a false identification or also false financial documents cannot get past it. So that's another thing that I'm, I'm working on as well. But to get back to the business credit and leverage, um, 
I wanted to use the example of business credit cards and things like that. So let's say that you want to start an Airbnb business or you want to start a business that you want to start using OPM or start off using credit or leverage of some sort. You cannot invest in a business that your velocity of money from the business model is low, meaning that you cannot take a credit card or borrow money to buy uh, real estate for a buy and hold perspective because your return your money is too slow. You're going to need to invest in a high velocity income business model that could be flipping houses, that could be your initial setup for wholesaling houses, that could be um, investing in a business model that has a high velocity like Airbnb or something like that. Most businesses actually take a year to, be, to become profitable, so you have to choose your business that you get into very wisely. Um, what are some cards that they can get starting out, and is it possible that they can get a business credit card without running on their own personal credit? So if you want to get a business credit card with no PG, you're going to have to most of the time go to a credit union. A credit union, with the credit union, you're going to have to establish a relationship with them, meaning opening up a business checking account and then actually putting some money into it. And then after a few months of the uh, entity being established, then you'll be allowed to, um, to be approved for EIN only credit card. However, there are some ways around that, like there's um, the term shell corporation. But when I, use, when I say shell corporation, you, this could be any type of corporation that is already established. Shelf corporation means that it's sitting on a shelf dormant, but shell just means that it is a corporation that may not currently be running in one way or another. But you can actually buy an e-commerce company, or I'm just using that just for an internet term. You can go on the website called Swappa, and you can purchase a low profit margin, high revenue real estate, I'm sorry, high, low profit margin, high revenue e-commerce company. And then when you're going to apply for business loans or financing, they look at the revenue numbers to help validate if you are able to qualify for those funds. So even though the profit margins are low, a lot of e-commerce businesses, the profit margins are low, um, you may be able to buy the business for a low EBITDA uh, multiple, meaning that you may be able to buy the business for a one to two, 2.5, maybe even three, three X EBITDA multiple, so you can SBA loan up to 90% of that. Then you can go and leverage the high revenue numbers of the e-commerce business you just bought to qualify for business funding and obtain leverage to either scale your business or even maybe even scale the e-commerce business and then exit that again. Because if you're able to purchase it that way, that means it's already been structured uh, to be sold. Awesome, man. That's, 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 that's powerful. All right, guys. So using a credit card, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have heard bad things about using credit cards or things like that. To be honest, I don't use my debit card, all right? I strictly use my credit card and my business credit card. And the reason for that is they give you perks. When you use your debit card, you're not getting any type of rewards. When I use my credit cards, I now have access to certain lounges like Delta. When I fly, I'm flying first class. I'm flying in, you know, I, I get to go to the lounge. I get, you know, points. You get certain access to hotels, things like that. So using these credit cards are gonna give you the benefit, all right? Now, of course, we're not just trying to get business credit run it up and then now we're not paying off our credit card so you're going to use it smartly all right but business credit is very important because like you said you can leverage that funding combined with your ideas all right because we all have ideas it's easy to come up with an idea but it's not necessarily easy to come up with the capital all right so we're going to be able to touch on that right now guys we have a um a chef he has the food i, I think the food at 9 30 what time is it now 9.05, okay. But we'll get some drinks, guys. The drink's gonna hit you a little bit harder without the food in your system, all right? So it's going to, we're gonna have a great time. One thing before ET, sit down, one thing. I know you're ready to eat, drink, and have a great time. One thing, guys, listen. It's called The Power of Doing More. I promise you guys, this book, I'm not even being biased because I made it. This book will change your life. I promise you. On the itinerary, we have the QR code, scan it. Get the book, guys. Get the book, leave me a nice review. This is gonna give you the same strategies that changed me from 40,000 to over 400,000 annual income in one year, and this year I'm doing over 750, all right guys? So if you wanna learn how I can manage over 15 streams of income and how you can do it too, get this book, guys. Thank you so much for everybody that's coming. I appreciate you guys. Thanks.